Welcome to mini lecture number five. This is your prep for Wednesday, September 6th. We're starting chapter two. And in particular, this mini lecture will cover 2.1 and 2.2. Before I cover that though, let's look ahead a little. For the remainder of this week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and all of next week, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we'll be covering chapters two, three, and four. Chapter two is on 1D motion, chapter three is on vectors, and chapter four is on 2D motion. And of course, you might go, wow, that's exactly what we covered in chapter one. And indeed it is, so breathe a sigh of relief. On the other hand, we're not just gonna cover the same stuff slower, we're gonna add a lot of rigor to it. We're back here at uh, 2.1 and 2.2 though. And in 2.1 and 2.2, he's doing a really nice and simple case of one dimensional motion. So recall, originally we started off with the idea that a particle could have coordinates x, y, and z. x, y, and z can each be functions of time. If you wanna say where a particle is at any given time, you have to say where it is at it. It, what its x value is at that time, what its y value is at that time, and what its z value is at that time. Now we assemble all three of these into vectors. Now actually in chapter one, we made a pretty substantial simplification. We basically didn't do any examples where there were three dimensions. So we we're down to this, x and y uh, coordinates, and x there is a function of t, and y is a function of t. Now in this section, uh, like he did in section 1.6, we're making things even simpler. It's either going to be a particle who has, which moves back and forth in the x direction, or it's going to be a particle that moves back and forth in the y direction, but not both. So in other words, we'll be down to this if it's a horizontal problem. Now sometimes Knight likes, likes to uh, not specify whether he's doing a horizontal problem or a vertical problem, in which case he'll use the coordinate s, and he'll say s is a function of t. And then when he uses s, he hasn't really said whether this s is the horizontal direction or s is the vertical direction. He's gonna derive some things that are true, whether s is horizontal or s is vertical. And there's one other thing that Knight wants to do. Uh, is we'll do some examples which are sort of intrinsically one-dimensional, even though the particle isn't going perfectly horizontally or perfectly vertically. For example, if you have a skier going down a slope, so here's my little skier, here's my little ski basket, uh, there's my skis. This is actually, in some ways, a one-dimensional problem. Why? Because as long as the skier can't hop off the slope or can't bury into the slope, as long as the skier is stuck to the surface of the slope, then all that can really happen is the skier can move down the slope with varying speeds, or even turn around and come back up. But one way or another, the skier does not leave or bury into the slope. So that makes this a one-dimensional problem. If you know how far the skier has gone this direction, you know where the skier is. So that's a third case where Knight will use S. He will use S when he means X for horizontal problems. He will use S when he means Y for vertical problems. And he sometimes might use S when you have, say, some kind of diagonal problem. It just allows him to do all three at once. Okay, so now let's look at section 2.1. Section 2.1, he starts talking about velocity. Now, the whole idea of velocity in 2.1 is it's uniform. This is a great simplification. Uniform velocity means the change in that coordinate s, whether that be x or y, that change in that coordinate is proportional to, and that's how I write proportional to on the board, the change in the time. So like if you're going 60 miles per hour, um, that would be a mile a minute. If delta t is one minute, then you've gone one mile. So the, the v that goes here in that case, uh, v sub s, would be equal to 60 miles per hour. That's the coefficient of proportionality of delta t. Uh, 
How can you see that that's the coefficient of proportionality? Because if you divide both sides through by delta t, then you have the very definition of v sub s. v sub s is delta s over delta t. Okay. Now, what does it mean, that mean? It means that if you look, say, for one minute, the person will have gone, the car will have gone one mile. If you look for half a minute, they'll have gone exactly half that much. If you went for twice as long as one minute, that is two minutes, they'll gone twice as far. So uh, at half a minute, you've gone half a mile. At one minute, you've gone one mile. And if you watch that person for two minutes, they'll have gone two miles. So as long as delta S is strictly proportional to delta T, we have what we call uniform motion. Now, sometimes we write this just a little differently. Instead of writing delta S is proportional to delta T, and we know now that the proportionality constant is V sub S, sometimes we'll write it a different way. We'll write S as a function of time is equal to S at T initial plus V sub S times delta T. Now what's delta T? Well, it's whatever the current time is minus the initial time. So that's V S of T minus T initial. Now be careful here. Notice that we're using parentheses for multiple things. This does not say V sub S evaluated at the time T minus T sub I. In this case, we're using V sub S uh, and then the parens to mean V sub S times T minus TI. And the time symbol has been suppressed there. So don't confuse evaluating a function at some point with just ordinary multiplication of something that happens to be in parentheses. So that's another way of writing that. Why is that? Because the time, delta T, is the current time minus the initial time. Okay. Now things get a little more complicated. Let's jump on to section 2.2. Let's suppose you're going to Sacramento. And let's suppose that you're only averaging 60 miles per hour going to Sacramento. The fact is, is that sometimes you'll be going slower than that and sometimes you'll be going faster than that. Maybe traffic opens up and all of a sudden you're going 65 and then maybe traffic bogs down and you're going to 45 or 50 or 55. So when you're averaging 60 miles per hour, that doesn't mean that you're always going 60 miles per hour. In fact, if I wrote, made a graph with time on a horizontal axis and my velocity in the direction of Sacramento, which maybe I'll call V sub S, on the vertical axis, V sub S is not necessarily uniform. That would be uniform. 60 miles per hour. But non-uniform might be that, hey, some of the time I'm going a little less than 60 and some of the time I'm going a little more than 60. So it might look something more like this. And that would be a slowdown area and that would be the traffic is wide open area. Wide open, slow down. And here I might be dropped down to 50 to 55, and up here when I'm wide open in these zones, I might be going 65, or knowing the way that traffic actually goes to Sacramento, who knows how fast. Um, okay, so you can see that velocity can change as a function of time. And that velocity, if you measure it really accurately at a certain point in time, that's what we call the instantaneous velocity. That's like what the radar gun would read out, what your speedometer would read out. It's not the average. The average is the amount of distance you covered in some significant amount of time. Like, hey, I went uh, in the last uh, 45 seconds, I went three quarters of a mile. And if you divide uh, three quarters of a mile by 45 seconds, you'll find that that's 60 miles per hour again. But 
my speed was changing during that 45 seconds, it might have been as low as 50 or as high as 65. So we need to be able to look at a position versus time graph. Now this is time on the horizontal axis, and this is position on the horizontal axis. Let's make this S. And as long as S is going linearly, as long as S is going linearly, we call that uniform motion. But sometimes S will start picking up, and when it picks up, you'll see that it arrives with a new and steeper slope. And now maybe I'm going uniformly here, and then maybe I slow back down again. And so then I'm going back with a shallower slope. This slope, which is, look at that as delta S, and you can look at that as delta T. This slope, which is the slope of that line, which is delta S over delta T, this slope is the velocity. And in a region like this, where the velocity is increasing, or in a region like this, where the velocity is decreasing, it's a little bit ambiguous what you mean by the velocity. So how do you do it? What you do is you make that time extremely short. So I'm gonna deliberately draw this almost so small that you can't see it on the screen. I made a little delta T, that's my little delta T, and I made a little delta S. And you take an extremely small triangle, and you look at that delta S, and you look at that delta T. You take an extremely small triangle, and you divide delta S by delta T. That is your velocity at this time. Now, why extremely small? Because if you make it sufficiently small, then in Really, and just keep making it smaller until this is true. If you make it sufficiently small, then over that extremely short time period, this side looks straight. Like, hey, you stand a little ways away from it, and this side looks curved. You zoom in a little more, this side still looks curved. But if you zoom in sufficiently tightly, you'll get to a point where that side looks straight. Once you scrunch the delta T up such that delta S over delta T basically looks constant over that time interval, now you have what we call v sub s at the time t. This is the instantaneous velocity. I think that's about all I have to say about 2.1 and 2.2 so far. You should go all the way up to page 38 and make sure that you understand uh, even how Knight is going to start introducing calculus into this. Those of you who already are uh, fully masters at calculus know that what we've defined here is the derivative, which is ds dt. Okay, see you Wednesday morning.